All right, everyone. Hey, thank you. Welcome back. Third panel, Solving Challenges in Electric Transportation. Uh, I'm excited to introduce our moderator for today. Is also our student organizer panel lead, uh, Zach Marcoux. Zach is a second-year student here at UCLA Anderson. He's the VP of Sustainable Mobility for ECA. Uh, he's completed MBA internships at Proterra and... I'm so sorry. Al Alpha Structure. Alpha Structure. Thank you, Zach. Yeah. Uh, he's currently working for Specifics, which is a lithium mining startup that's based out of the UCLA Institute for Carbon Management. Very cool stuff. Uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Zach. Awesome. Thank you very much to our, our great MC here, Alex Wolfson. Also, happy St. Patrick's Day to everybody. I don't think we've said that yet. Um, yeah, very excited for this EV panel. Uh, this is you know, something we've been looking forward to for a very long time. Um, I'm going to hand it off to our great panelists here to, to give uh, an introduction of themselves. So I'm going to pass it on to, to Elsa first, and we'll, we'll go down the line. Sure. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Elsa Yu. I work for Southern California Edison. Um, I'm an alum of Anderson, so I was telling Zach it's very weird being back because this building did not exist when I went to school here. So you guys have it much nicer, let me just say that. Um, as part of my work at uh, Southern California Edison, I work in our e-mobility team, which means I'm responsible for deploying charging station, doing strategy work for figuring out how utilities are going to have the grid ready for charging, working with folks like my other panelists here, companies they're where they're from, trying to figure out how we're going to be ready for them when they want to put chargers or vehicles out into the market. So very interesting and welcome any questions you guys may have. Great. Oh. Um, well, I'm Nell Oliver. I'm Vice President of Program Management and Internal Operations at EVGO. Um, EVGO, for those of you who don't know, is a public company. Our mission is to expedite the mass adoption of electric vehicles by providing a convenient, reliable and affordable fast charging network for, ev for all. Um, so things I talk about today are going to be fitting under that mission. We, we really strongly believe in what we're doing and we focus on fast charging. Um, I've been there for about five years. My current role is VP Program Management and Internal Operations. I oversee all the performance management for the company. I oversee the operations analytics that supports our deployment team. And I oversee a number of cross-functional um, strategic initiatives for the company around pricing, around pro um, customer experience, and new product development. And I'm very much looking forward to being here today. And I wanted to thank Zach and also the, um, the club, the energy club, because we've worked with um, you guys for, I think, at least five years since I've been at EVGO and have had a great relationship having you guys into our office and online and have hired several um, folks as interns and as full-time employees. So I'm really pleased to be here. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, my name is Sarah. I am the director of program management at Exostrax. For those who don't know, um, we manufacture class five, six, seven, eight vehicles, as well as provide kind of like a full package solution for our fleets and customers, including uh, energy solutions, uh, exos uh, exosphere, which is a proprietary uh, fleet management software, etc. So, trying to provide like the a seamless experience for our customers um, and fleets. Um, at Exos, I lead the program management team. We are a team of seven, and we basically provide um, project and program management support across the organization. So not only on the product development side, on vehicles, but also on infrastructure, um, charging solutions, um, service, etc. So kind of like um, horizontally across the organization. And it's my first time here. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, the campus looks amazing. And yeah, welcoming any questions. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to all of our panelists. So the title of our panel is Solving Challenges in Electric Transportation. Uh, the reason it's that title is because we brought together all these great different perspectives across EVs. We have Sarah in, from an EV manufacturer. We have Nell from uh, EVGO, a charging infrastructure company. And we have uh, Elsa from Southern California Edison, the, you know, the utility that, that brings it all together. So try and get all these perspectives here and hear about the different challenges and then how we can start solving these challenges. So the way, the way we're going to run the panel, we're going to do some tailored questions to each of our panelists here. Then we're going to open it up to some broader questions about the EV industry, uh, and we'll finish off with some audience Q&A. Um, so our first question will, will go to Sarah. Um, so one of the challenges that we're seeing across the industry is how, how difficult it is to scale production. We're seeing you know, the established OEMs having difficulty with 
you know, with building out their production and, you know, even our newer OEMs. Um, you know, it's just this difficulty meeting this new abundance of demand coming into EVs. So, Sarah, what, what makes EV production particularly difficult and, and how does Exos cope with this challenge? Yeah, so, um, as you know, vehicle production in general is challenging, it's not only EVs. We have it a little bit easier in terms of uh, our vehicles have less components than IC trucks, so uh, we do have some advantage there, but we still face some of the challenges that other OEMs are facing, such as supply chain constraints. So since COVID kicked, um, we are still seeing the delay on many of these uh, products and availability at the volumes that we are needing. So uh, that's been a big, big challenge, and probably also uh, here in uh, companies like EBO and other uh, EBGO and other uh, hardware manufacturers. Um, how we are trying to cope with that is by uh, diversifying our supply chain, so allowing us for more flexibility on where do we source our components from. Uh, that's a big one. The second one uh, that might be um, shared with other OEMs would be um, cost of inventory or cost of capital and inventory. So uh, we are uh, an early stage company, so we're trying to be very mindful of um, hold, on hold inventory and um, where, does, where does that money go? So to cope with that, we are becoming extremely proficient and putting a lot of emphasis on uh, balancing the amount of inventory that we have in hand and allowing for a lot of planning between component lead time on the supply chain side, ensure, ensuring that R&D and, and development um, comes together with that sales uh, demand as well as vehicle delivery uh, ties into this same timeline. Um, energy infrastructure or charger installation, same thing. So by that kind of having all these um, planning together and communication among these teams allows us to plan better for not having a lot of inventory in hand. Um, that would be kind of maybe the two challenges that are probably similar to other OEMs. In terms of specific EB industry challenges that we are facing, I would say the major one is um, charging infrastructure. So even though that doesn't affect our vehicle production, we could produce as many vehicles as we want without kind of having to wait for infrastructure, as we were talking about inventory, we don't want to have a lot of vehicles in hand that then cannot be deployed due to maybe customers still not having chargers in place. So that's becoming a real struggle. And what we are doing at Exos is um, we have an Exos uh, energy solutions team that is fully dedicated on uh, providing infrastructure solutions to our customers, uh, recommendations on best type of chargers uh, for specific um, uh, customer and vehicle type, as well as uh, incentive uh, recommendations, etc. cetera. Um, as well as we are trying to become very creative, our R&D and engineering teams on solutions to help uh, mitigate these uh, infrastructure challenges or delays that we are facing. And a really cool product that uh, we launched uh, is the Exos Hub, which is uh, a mobile charging solution um, that uh, has, a, a, well, it's basically like a huge battery um, allowing us to charge five vehicles at the same time. So um, that's th these type of things are helping us uh, with uh, the infrastructure challenging challenge that we're seeing. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, that actually leads really well into our next question. So the next question is for Nell and Elsa. You know, similar to the issue in scaling EV production, um, the industry really needs to scale up a lot of EV charging stations. So Southern California Edison has a goal of installing 30,000 uh, stations in California, and EVgo has a goal to triple its size in the next five years. So these are huge goals. Um, so the question for both of you would be, what are the constraints and challenges to reaching these lofty goals of hundreds of thousands of charging stations? Maybe Elsa first. Sure, of course. Uh, so one of the programs I lead is the Charger A Light Duty program. So like Zach said, we have a goal of putting in 30,000 or more light duty charging stations, specifically for level two, uh, over the next, uh, I think between now and 2027. The thing is, we're a utility, so we use ratepayer dollars to help fund these charging stations. And being a regulated utility, um, I know, 
utility so sexy, right? It is. <laughs> Thanks, see if she gets me. Um, totally get it. So the thing is, it's, it's very different from startups, very different from your typical company. We have our regulators we're dealing with. We have the public, which is all of our, everyone in Southern California, Edison is pretty, Southern California is our customer. So we have a lot of different competing priorities. So for us, it's not just about simply putting in 30,000 chargers. It's about how do we do it the right way in a responsible way for our rate base, our customers. So as we put in these charging stations, we're not only working with cities, local governments, our regulators, uh, the state of California to put them in. We're, we're also working with like real people. So we have to do things like thinking about who wouldn't get a charging station. We all know city of Irvine's going to get all the charging stations they need, right? I mean, they're a pretty wealthy city. You would think that there's the funding there. I mean, maybe, maybe not. But you know that there's communities, especially state-designated disadvantaged communities, who aren't going to get those charging stations. So the responsibility of a utility like Edison is making sure everyone gets electrified, I suppose, at the same pace. So that's the challenge, I guess, on a level that's very different from a typical company. In addition to that, we have switch gear delays, uh, trying to get power in the ground, getting the behemoth of a regulated giant utility to all work together within the utility to get it happen, working with folks like EVgo and many other vendors to get their equipment ready and certified and meeting all state regulations to participate in our program to get funding. And then finally, working with folks like OEM manufacturers to understand what do these vehicles actually need? I mean, I understand that Amazon's putting in a huge electrified fleet, but does that mean they're going to need us to build a substation? Substations can take decades to put in. So if Amazon doesn't know that yet, we can't even start building that yet. So very complicated. And solutions are not all there yet. It's definitely still the Wild West, I'd say. Great. Um, yeah, uh, so... Many of, I'll echo some of the things, same things that Elsa said and, and sort of express it from the pr perspective of an EG, EV charging company. And we work with many utilities and, and always hear rave reviews about working with SCE. So very, very innovative work that you guys are doing. Um, so from our standpoint, uh, you know, we're working, we do work with, um, we have a whole fleet side of the business, our retail side of the business. Um, you know, right now, this past year, about 5% of battery electric vehicles sold were electric vehicles. 5% of electric vehicles sold were battery electric vehicles. In by 2030, it will be 40% of electric vehicles will be sold will be, um, 40% of vehicles sold will be battery electric vehicles. So it's going to be a big, um, growth. Uh, the infrastructure needed is going to be about eight times the size of what exists today. So eight times more, uh, chargers are going to be needed out there, which is just mind boggling to think about that. Um, from our standpoint, I think the most challenging and, and opportunity, too, is it's the coordination of all the different parties that need to get together to make this happen. This is a completely new industry. It's never been done before. Um, we're kind of writing the rule book as we go along, not just us, but all of the, the folks in it. It's, it's a really exciting time to be in this industry because it's if you, if you like going into the unknown. Um, the, uh, so I guess to, to give an example for us, for our folks, from the time the shovel goes into the ground to the time the construction is done is about four to eight weeks. Um, but if you look at all the elements, so from signing a site to find a location for a charging station, if, and I'm talking about fast charging, so those are the chargers that charge your car in, in 30 to 45 minutes. Um, so signing the site to actually putting it into operation so that a customer can charge the car, that can take up to 18 months. So there's a big difference between how much time it's taking us and all the different things that need to occur outside of our business to make the charging station become operational. And what what is I think is the most important for us is getting all these parties on this you know on the same page. And um, you know it's everyone from the EV charging companies to the contractors that we work with to build the sites to the automakers that are, are are producing the cars. And we need to understand their timing because it's really important for us to to build ahead of the demand, but we don't want to build too far ahead of the demand, um, to the site hosts that we have to work with, the folks, the retailers, the grocery stores, the banks that are providing the space for the charging stations. Um, sometimes it's easy to work with those folks, but oftentimes there's, there's many layers of people you need to work with there and getting all of that coordinated. To the utilities, a fundamental partner to us. Um, we have, you know, they're doing everything from helping site the 
the charging station on the property to up upgrading the equipment on site to permitting is a huge one for us. And of course, actually energizing the site is done by the utility as well. So along the way, we might have places where we are waiting for extended periods of time. Our work is done, but we're waiting for the utility to do a piece of work so that we can continue on. Um, and, and of course, you know, there's, uh, and then finally, the final partner is obviously the government, and there are many different government entities involved, from the federal to the state, to the local government. The local um, authorities um, having jurisdiction, the AHJs are the, the important ones on the ground who have to permit um, our sites. And anywhere along the way, we can end up with delays that extend this timeline out much more than we would like. What EVGO has done, EVGO has been a leader. We've been around for a while. Um, a couple of years ago, we decided to take to create an organization called Connect the Watts, where we bring these stakeholders together to discuss these issues and make decisions as an industry. You know what, what's going to help us expedite things further. We started a um, Charging Heroes program this past year to really highlight the folks, the utilities, the um, contractors, the folks in the industry that are that have sort of best practices and, and what things that we want to share and shine a spotlight on for others in the industry. We have best practice guides that our team develops um, and sort of, again, highlighting best practices and bringing their expertise so that we can get the word out. Um, we publish these on our website. We share them wherever, wherever we can get them out to, um, to spread the word about what's, what's really working. So I think the coordination across uh, you know, the industry is going to be is fundamentally important to making all of this happen. So as we can see, there's a lot, of, a lot of different parties involved in this very complicated solution. Mm -hmm. um, we're going we're gonna to switch back to the, the OEM perspective. Um, so we, we often hear about advancements in electric vehicle technology. We hear about solid state batteries, lithium iron phosphate batteries. Uh, so the question here is, you know, how does Exos plan for keeping up with all these advancements in EV technology? And, and also a second part of that, are there any advancements that you're particularly excited about? Well, here is where we go, let our engineers go wild. Uh, no, not, not wild, not fully wild, but yeah, we let them kind of get into the innovation and creation. Um, we have an amazing team of uh, engineering and R&D, and they come up with great solutions for the challenges that we're finding, as well as uh, look into what comes next and what, how do we improve, how, what features do we add to our uh, current vehicles and products. Um, so that would be one thing, uh, having this great team. Another thing that um, I think it's uh, a key to keep going is understanding customer demand and uh, where things are moving forward. So, for example, in a passenger vehicle, ADAS, for example, advanced uh, 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 safety systems have been a must. Um, for commercial vehicles, it hasn't been that. Uh, it's not a requirement. It's not a must. But we are seeing our customers uh, ask more and more about this. They have um, cost implications related to ADA systems in terms of insurance, etc. So um, this type of feedback is very helpful for us to include this type of projects in future vehicle development. And also we keep a close eye on um, regulations in the horizon. Uh, internally, we have even a Slack channel. Every person at the company participates in a Slack channel called Industry News. We make sure that we are all up to speed on anything that's coming so that we can keep ahead of the curve and make sure that, um, yeah, our products are still and keep being um, uh, the best in the market. Great. Thank you. Um, so we're going to, we have two more of these tailored questions. So we're, we're going to hand it to Nell here. So um, what we've seen is that EVGO's mission is to expedite the mass adoption of EVs. They're a big piece of, you know, big piece of the puzzle here. And, and a big part of that is the convenience, reliability, and affordability of the overall charging network. So with all these new customers coming online, we have seen press about reliability concerns with, with EV charging stations, not just at EVGO, but across the whole industry. Um, how does EVGO address these customer experience issues and, and work to improve uh, uh, overall yeah. uptime? It is a great question. Um, something that's fundamentally important to our company from the highest CEO through the, through the company is our customer experience. It's one of our top level company objectives. We want to build a world-class, seamless customer experience for EV, chart, for EV drivers whether that's the drivers that have been driving for a while or all the many new drivers that come on the market. We want it to be as easy to charge your car as it is to plug in your iPhone and charge. Um, and, and, there's, and we're getting there, but it's, it's, it's definitely not there yet. 
Um, I'll, I'll sort of break it into two chunks. One is the product innovation and customer experience work that we're doing to make it a really great experience. And then the second, I'll address reliability. Um, customer experience, we're working on innovations to make it a great customer experience. So for example, we recently launched a product called Auto Charge Plus. Auto Charge Plus allows you to take any electric vehicle that, um, that and plug it into our charging stations and automatically it starts charging your car. So if you're familiar with Tesla, you go to Tesla Supercharger, you don't need to interface with an app, an RFID card or a credit card, you can automatically charge. We're now making that possible with um, compatible EVs that uh, to charge with our network. You can register on our app and uh, your, your VIN and, and automatically charge. Um, we've launched other, we're doing other things like reservations. Our customers were saying, you know, charging stations are sometimes busy. We'd like to be sure that a charger is available when we come in. So we're pilot testing reservations in 50 locations. We launched EVgo Rewards, a rewards program for our drivers. We have a pro product called EVgo Advantage, which is a, is a product that delivers, uh, uh, offers to our customers when they're exclusive offers when they're charging at our sites, at our, at our site host partners. So for example, at Cumberland Farms, if you're charging your car, you get a little uh, coupon that says, hey, come on in and get a coffee or a soda while you're charging your car. That's a win-win for the customer, something for them to do, a nice benefit. And it's nice for our site host because ultimately the site host, one of the things they want is to have customers, they, one of the reasons that incentivizes them to put in EV charging is because they want those customers in their store. So we want to try to figure out ways to, to help the infrastructure build by bringing people into the store as well as you know, benefit our customers. Um, we also have a number of different types of customers. So we're working on innovations around plans and pricing. Somebody who's charging several times a week, maybe it's someone living in multi-unit housing that doesn't have access to their own home charging. Maybe it's a rideshare driver. Um, those people have plans that are different than a plan for someone that's only charging when they go on a vacation a couple of times a year. Um, so we're working hard to think about what are the right pricing plans that, that make it um, the, the product most useful for our customers. So lots of things on the customer experience side. On the reliability side, um, we want to make sure we're continuing to work on making sure our chargers are up, up as much as possible and working really well for our customers. Um, we have this year launched a new effort called EVgo Renew, which is building on and, and expanding on the work that we've done in the past around ensuring our charging network is working. We're replacing, um, up, um, expanding, and in some cases, cases retiring chargers that are. Um, our old, we have some of our, our chargers have been in the network and are ending the end, nearing the end of their life. We're working on upgrading those chargers. In some places, we're expanding sites where we have maybe only one or two chargers. We want to make those four or five, six chargers um, sites or more. And uh, in some cases, we are retiring chargers where we have a site maybe that we put in 10 years ago and, it, and perhaps we've put up another newer site in, close by. And in those cases, we want to make, we're always letting customers know you know, we have customers that rely on us and, and, and for, their, for their livelihood often. We want to make sure they know, you know, we've put up another charger in a, in a location that um, is going to make sense for you. So, um, so we have that. We also have an entire EVgo Renew program that we um, launched internally, which is, we call it a six-point program. And I'll just, I'll tell you the six points. It's interesting. You can read, read more about it online. But, um, you know, we have a whole prevention cap, um, component to it which has, we have an innovation lab in El Segundo, as well as some of our OEMs, where we focus on um, testing our charges and making sure we're preventing issues that occur, that might occur. Um, diagnostics, where we look at customer feedback coming in from surveys. We survey customers at multiple points along the journey. We get feedback from our app. We get feedback from PlugShare. We get feedback from the call center. We take all that. Um, and we use natural language processing and other tools to make sure we're understanding that feedback and using it. Um, our analysts are, are using it properly. We get lots of, obviously, insights from our systems as well. Um, from there, we decide, is this an issue that needs to be responded to rapidly, in which case we have a rapid response team that either goes, you know, works on charges in the field or works on software fixes. If things are going to take more analysis, they move moves to an analysis team that digs in deeper to figure out what are the things we need to do here, what do we need to put in place, do we need to um, put a whole charger, uh, you know, some kind of special campaign in place. Um, one of the backbones, this, the fifth part of our EVgo Renew is resilience and redundancy. So we are strategically wanting to make the NIT network as resilient as possible. So whatever occurs, it's going to be up and running for everybody. Building in redundancies wherever we can, which means things like mo bigger sites with more chargers, bringing different backup communication methods if one uh, communication method fails. And finally, the final point is uh, co continuous customer service. 
Um, we have 24-7 customer service reps available to help our, our customers, our drivers. If they have any problem at a charger, they can call in at any time. Um, we also have uh, fantastic resources that we're developing on our website and our, on our app uh, to ensure that we're getting both the existing customers the help they need as well as all the many new customers coming online educated about, about what they're doing. Great. All right. Thank you, Neil. Um, our, our last tailored question here is for Elsa. So you know, with all this momentum behind EVs, uh, we're going to have a lot more strain on our electrical grid. You know, California's energy grid were already challenged by wildfires, blackouts. Um, it's already difficult to you know, deal with the capacity that we have, but we're adding, you know, we need to add a lot more capacity. So how does Southern California Edison or Edison International plan and accommodate for the electrical burden of, of EVs? Yeah, this is a great question. I'm sure it's on everyone's mind. What are we going to do as more EVs come into California? And as we know, California is where all the EVs are pretty much right now. And everyone in California, everything we do is honestly, like, to be very honest, like an example for the rest of the nation as the rest of the nation catches up to electrify. So what is Southern California Edison doing? So multiple things have to happen to target this this, this very, very complex question. So the first one, the, the very easy, uh, easy like the easy, low-hanging fruit item is that Edison is doing what we can to launch studies, launch pilots, various programs to figure out what can we do to increase uh, energy savings from EV charging. So there's pilots we're doing in load management, managed charging, uh, we're doing things for vehicle to grid. There's, uh, for anyone experienced, there's like V to X, V to B, V to, v to many different alphabet symbols. <laughs> so we're doing many of those. And, but that's just the low hanging fruit. Those are just small pilot programs. I mean, granted, there's millions and millions of dollars in them, but from the point of a utility, it's small. What we really need to do is change how we do things. So right now, Edison, I would say that our transportation, electrif tra transportation electrification portfolio, and by that I mean uh, our programs to increase charging stations, give funding, uh, incentivize medium heavy duty and light duty charging and vehicles, get more of those out in the road. Our portfolio represents about a billion dollars right now. So that includes residential rebates and commercial rebates as well. But that's not enough. Um, the market is growing significantly. So in our next general rate case, and I know this is a very utility term, but we're a regulated utility and we have to get permission from our regula regulators on how much money we're allowed to make. So in our next general rate case, we're increasing that portfolio by, by I believe, $4 billion just for TE investments. This, so this is very new, very different for the utility industry. And adding to that, we are continuing to do things like trying to trying how to anticipate where the load is coming from. So for the past 125 years, 150 years, the way utilities work is that someone says, hey, EVgo says, hey, I'm building an Exos trucks or site here in Bakersfield, and the trucks are going to like, there's going to be a lot of trucks. They need a lot of charging, and you're going to need a lot of power. And we're going to say, hey, we're not going to build the power now. You have to tell us how much power you need, and then we'll build it. It's kind of like, when they come, we will build. But how do we change that scenario? Because uh, right now, when we do things like apply for a substation, which is huge, mind you. It involves environmental reviews, permitting, cities approving. It's like huge. Um, our regulators have to say yes, and that can take years. So even if we request it in a month, it doesn't matter. Our re regulators on a regular cadence, they can take years to approve one of our requests. So what's really needed is wide scale change across the market. Our regulators need to move faster. Local permitting needs to move faster. Um, honestly, everyone, including us, the utility, needs to move faster. So, so I guess to answer your question, at Edison, one of the things we're grappling with now is how do we change as an industry? Who's been around for 150 years? I mean, we're pretty set in our ways. Uh, so what we're really trying to do is just trying to think innovatively, how do we partner with folks that work faster in the market than we do to figure out what's needed? How do we work with them? How do they tell us where they're going to build faster? 
So that relationship building is just so important right now. And I know that whatever we do now, it's going to get copied. It's already being copied at other states. So to, to my, to, I think Nell said this. This is a very exciting industry right now. It's, it's pretty crazy. I know I say it's like the Wild West, but that's why it's so fun. Great. All right. So we're going to ask two more general questions to the whole panel here. So feel free to chime in if you have an answer, or add on to someone else's answer. Then, then after these two questions, we'll open it up to, to all of you. Um, so my next question is about the Inflation Reduction Act. So in the last year, we've had so many great developments with regulation, supportive of clean tech and electric vehicles. How does the Inflation Reduction Act or other federal programs impact the work you're doing? Oh, gosh. How doesn't it impact? Right. So, <laughs> exactly. so what happens, and I can already, I think I'm speaking for Nell too in this, you is are. that a bunch of people, especially cities, they realize, oh my goodness, I can apply for these federal grants. I'm going to get so much money for my city. And then they think they're going to get that much money. And they go to Nell probably and they're going to, they tell her, I'm going to buy a bunch of your charters. And they tell me, you better have the power ready for my, my charters from EVGO. And I say, but where's your money? Show me this piece of paper that says you're actually going to get the money. I can't build until, I can't spend all this money putting, like, sending my guys out there, telling them to trench in the ground, putting in many thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars of, like, copper cable and labor and guys pouring concrete. I can't do all that unless I actually know you're going to do it, if you're, you're actually in it. So that kind of funding, it creates so much churn. Ultimately, in five years, it will all be for the better. We're all going to see more charging stations. It's going to be amazing. But I would say right now, I don't know if, Nell, you agree with me, it causes a lot of churn, and that kind of churn is opportunity for the market for all the MBA folks. Like, if someone <laughs> could go out there and figure out how to better do consulting, better help um, guide these cities and small time like mom and pop retail shopping centers who think they're going to get the funding big big organizations who think they're going to get the fundings local governments and cities who think they're going to get the funding if someone can help connect them with utility funding and then like work with folks like EVGO i mean that's the answer but right now it's just crazy it's like simply crazy yeah, I would, I, would, I would echo that entirely. Um, we're seeing it from a slightly different perspective. We're, we're really excited about you know, both the um, 30C, the, the um, tax credit that's coming with the Inflation Reduction Act, but also the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Plan, which these are both exciting, monumental um, ch changes and, and, and uh, programs that have been passed and put in place by the federal government and, and are going to be very exciting over the long term. Um, but for sure, right now, we're... We're excited. We're, we're plan, you know, looking to, to, we're figuring out, you know, the, each of these, for the NEVI, for example, is funding infrastructure across the entire country. So all of the interstates are going to have charging stations every 50 miles, one mile from the interstate itself. Each of the state's funding plans have now been, the, each of the state's plans have now been approved. Now that, so the funds are available and now we're waiting for them to put out the RFPs so that we can apply and hopefully submit sites and, and win you know, some of these, these projects. So it's, it's, the funding is, is fundamental and really, really important to our business and to the growth of the industry. Um, but for sure, there's challenges around timing and, 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 like I said earlier, getting all the players aligned around how this is all going to happen. So um, it is a bit of a wild west right now. I do not disagree with that. But, but overall, it's a really, really big plus, and, and it's going to propel the industry undoubtedly. Yeah, uh, specifically on the IRA uh, for vehicle, um, all our vehicles right now qualify to get the maximum funding, which is uh, $40,000 of federal tax credit back, which is huge. I think that's making a big impact for us and our customers to be competitive and uh, kind of reduce this total cost of ownership of the vehicles. Um, in the incentive and funding program in general, it is like you really need to have a master's to understand it and to be able to apply it. Like I keep telling my team, hey guys, like this sheet that you've put together that helps us decide like what incentive is best for this customer, this state, this region, we should sell this. We could make a lot of money. Um, just kidding. But um, yeah, big, 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 big um, opportunity. Still kind of a way to go to understand the whole impact that uh, we can have. Great. Uh, we're going to ask one more question. So we talked about a lot of the challenges. You've heard about all these different parties involved that are needed to bring the whole picture together so we can switch to 
to electric transportation. But we don't want to end on all, all doom and gloom here. Um, so we want to end on a bit more of an optimistic note. So I want to ask all of you, are, are there any particular developments that make you excited about the future of electric vehicles? I can start. Um, we rebuilt, I believe it was last week or two weeks ago at Work Track Week, um, our new model of Stepan, the 2023 Stepan. So I would encourage everyone here to go check out the Exos uh, website. Uh, so that's, I am very excited about that. Uh, and also we are going to be revealing another product for uh, ACT, uh, the ACT Expo in May. So also keep tuned on that one. I cannot say anything just yet, but <laughs> in a couple of months it will be out. Right. Yeah, I would say there's so many things to be excited about. It's an amazing industry to be working in. Um, and it's exciting to go to work because you're work, working with these people that are just mission driven and wanting to make a difference to the impact to climate change, which is very, just makes you excited to go to work every day. Um, so excited about that, excited about autonomous vehicles coming, excited about uh, many of the new cool vehicles coming. I, but I think the thing that most excites me is thinking about the health benefits to some of the affected communities, that are communities that are affected now by by emissions. And when you think about, and, and we do a lot of work around making sure that we're building out, as, as um, Elsa said, and SCE does too, thinking about making sure our network planning model, for example, is addressing needs in, in um, environmental justice needs, not just planning to build where the most you know, the, the highest income zip codes. Like we're looking very carefully and making sure we're, we're building out. But I, I think about those communities and I think about the people that are living by the really busy highways right now, the intersection of the 10 and the 405 and you know, all the fumes that are coming to them and the noise that's coming. And again, and thinking like 20, 30 years from now, it's going to be different. There'll be electric vehicles. It'll be quieter. There won't be the emissions coming and, and it'll be a healthier um, environment for people to live in. So I think that's probably the thing that I'm most excited about. <sighs> Yeah, and for me, what I want to say, but this is going to sound super boring, is that I'm excited that local cities are going to be required to approve EV permits. Like, right. with, with, I forget, <laughs> it's like AV like 1236. I forget, right. I forget which one it is. But no, I'm not going to say that boring one. Uh, my, I think one thing we didn't really talk about as much today was home charging. Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of people, when they get EVs, if they have a single family home, they're going to be charging at home. So one thing I'm excited about that Edison is doing is we're actually going to be releasing a new program to upgrade panels at home for level two charging. So it's not official yet, and you know technically it's not the news is not PR ready yet. But Edison will be helping a lot of folks, especially our low income customers, get panel upgrades so that they can be EV ready. So just to upgrade a panel in a single family home can range for honestly like as low as like $500 if your house is ready to it all the way to $7,000 depending on how old your home is and how far your you know your level your 240 outlet where you put it and how far you want to you want to bring the line and whatever um, so i'm excited about that because traditionally i mean everyone thinks of EVs as a rich man's car i know in california that's changing but it's not changing fast enough. So by doing things like making homes EV ready, by putting EV go charging stations near multi-unit dwellings, it's going to signal to everyone in the market that, oh, I can buy that car. And Edison is going to give you a rebate if you f for buying that car, especially if it's a used car. So, so yeah, so it's going to be exciting. I think in five years, the students who sit in these seats, like everything will be different. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so now we're going to hand it off to some questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. Felipe is going to be helping out and uh, bringing the microphone around. So thank you. Awesome. Can you guys hear me? Awesome. I'm James Moody, uh, first year full-time MBA. Uh, thank you guys. I appreciate having a panel who thinks infrastructure is interesting. Uh, so thank you guys for that. But I understand we have a theme here uh, we call thinking in the next. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of chatter about, you know, uh, the EV tall transition, excuse me, the transition for mobility on the ground. Um, but I'm thinking about electrification in the air. Um, EV tall is electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Um, also the addition of sustainable fuels. Uh, so I guess this question is more for Elsa with uh, South, Southern California Edison. Have you guys been hearing much chatter, uh, whether it's from the manufacturers or from the airports, whether it's municipal, LAX, uh, et cetera, about you know, how they're gonna get transmission lines in the ground or how they're gonna, whether it's gonna be mobile. So I've been hearing much chatter about that and whether you have or have not, 
are you guys planning for electrification uh, in the air after electrification on the ground? Wow, you're really bringing thinking to the next, to like yeah. really to the next, right? <laughs> How many years? Um, no, I would say, yeah, I do talk to airports. I will say that about electrifying the airports. But the airports aren't really thinking about electric planes right now. I mean, I think the vendors and the startups who are working on electric planes have talked about it to us, talked about like how am I going to bring a charger to their hangar or whatnot. But the larger airports, I would say they're more worried about how am I going to electrify that vehicle that transports everyone's luggage? Um, can I bring in more power for that? They, what they're really looking at is electrifying all that equipment first. So I've had a lot of conversations there. And it's actually a very interesting use case because those, you know, they're always there and they can just charge when they're right there. So it's a perfect thing to get charged. Um, but back to your question about the air, uh, the planes, I think that one of the challenges that those startups have is that they need funding to get the chargers at their hangars or they need funding to get Edison to bring power to where they are and that funding is very hard to get. All right, next question. Hi, that was a great discussion, thanks. Um, I'm Nitika, I'm from, from the Center for Impact at Anderson. Um, it was amazing to hear that there's still discussion about, you know, having more equitable uh, end to the consumers, sort of being from disadvantaged communities, having chargers, like, throughout those networks, irrespective of who has more money. Um, I was thinking about the source end of equity in the sense that with the rising demand for electricity with EVs, um, I was wondering how much of that concentration was on where your electricity is going to come from. Um, so I know that a lot of electricity comes from hydro or nuclear, but like, are you planning to reduce where you're sourcing it from? Because like, it's hard, it's like a fine line, um, calling it clean in the sense that, you know, everything has repercussions. Like hydro is not 100% clean, um, nuclear has its own challenges. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how you were trying to sort of divide and make the equity around sourcing fuel um, to produce that much electricity. It's funny because Elsa said utilities aren't sexy, but we're getting all utility questions. <laughs> right. so. Hey, yeah, yeah, come talk to me. You guys yeah. want to, the moment you get sucked into the utilities, you don't go yeah. back. Um, but that's a great question. I mean, you're right. We talk a lot about at the utilities, every single program I run, we do a carve out for how can I carve out a bunch of my funding to target disadvantaged communities specifically. But when you talk about where the power itself comes from, that's a very difficult question. So that is a question or a challenge that to fix it, now that one truly takes decades. So when you talk about California and the challenges California faces with climate change, I mean, you guys have seen it, right? Lots of wildfires out there. And with that comes a lot of investment into grid resiliency. Um, and for grid resiliency, how do we make sure the power is there? I mean, a lot of utilities across the nation still using coal peaker plants, right? Um, honestly, it's the fastest, maybe not cheapest, but it's the fastest way to get more power on the grid when you're facing things like brownouts or whatnot. Um, so in our planning, at least for Edison, we're doing what we can to figure out where can we source our power. I mean, obviously, we have a lot, we, you know, we generate a lot of our own power, but when we do things on the market on a broader scale and we're planning decades ahead, and I've seen plans that people make at Edison where it's like 50 years ahead. It's like for when everyone's like going to be retired, basically. <laughs> and those plans, you'll see uh, how we're really figuring out how to use more things like wind power, solar power. How do we, maybe we won't be sourcing uh, solar power or uh, turning down our coal plants, but maybe we'll, we'll be investing more in the open market in solar. So we're trying to increase that. I will say in the residential market, we've been funding solar for a while and encouraging people to get solar. And it's really, really helps. And it's reflective in our rates now. So now we're talking years now, now that we've got, we got people to do solar. And now the next round of energy rates, we can say at this time of the day, all you guys are putting solar. So now rates are cheaper. And then then it becomes our job to then like connect the next puzzle piece of how can we train everyone who's our customer 
to charge their cars at that period of time because it's cheaper. It's not always easy, and you have to do a lot of things. Like I'm sure EVgo and like the trucks do this too. How do you manage? Man, how do you do manage charging, and how do you build it into other companies so that Edison is not doing it all ourselves? And interestingly, we no. recently launched time of use rates also. So, and we're, um, we, when we switched over to kilowatt hour rates in California and now in many other states, I think we have 20 now, we are charging by time of use. So we're trying to align, trying to incentivize customers to charge at, at particular times a day using, using different rates offered at different uh, windows of time. So similar to what you guys are doing, the retail rates. Yeah, and I, I think I mentioned it before, but we also have the Exosphere, which is our fleet management software that yeah. allows fleets to charge at specific rates and times so that they can reduce um, uh, also the cost of this electricity. So kind of like all working in yeah. similar... Um, all trying solutions. to tell that cus the same customer, please charge at this period of time. Uh, don't just like plug it in. Like you actually use the apps and whatever to like manage your charging. Hi, I'm Arithrika. I'm a second year student, and thanks again for coming here. So my question is a bit broader. So I was wondering, how do you see uh, the emerging alternate you know, fuels market affecting the demand for electrification in the next 10 years? So for context, like we already have hydrogen fueling stations and fuel cells kind of you know, being developed and installed, and it's a promising market as well that's being discussed. So how do you see you know, these different forms of um, energy sources in a way balancing out and how does that impact electrification? I spoke a lot so I want to offer first dibs to you guys <laughs> but I'll go. With you. Yeah um, I think that they are okay so I think that it's great honestly like mo the more cleaner um, um, fuels we can get for transportation the better. I don't think that we should be feeling intimidated because I am now like developing and selling uh, um, electric vehicles, in, in, being intimidated about the hydrogen um, vehicles, you know. Um, so I think that it's all great. It's all for good purpose. Um, my understanding, and maybe you guys know a little bit more about this, but um, hydrogen stations are extremely expensive to build. So that is, I think, creating a little bit of a challenge on that end to kind of scale as fast as we can scale uh, with electric vehicles and charging installation. So maybe you can add a little bit more detail on that, but that could be like a little bit my input. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I would say um, on, the, on the issue of scaling, the utility infrastructure, we're everywhere already. So when you talk about hydrogen, it's going to be a huge hump for them to get into the market. So, you th so then you get to wonder, Maybe hydrogen isn't the answer for your regular old passenger vehicle. What I'm seeing really in the market is we have these really big fleets. And I'm talking about like things from ports who man shipping containers and rubber tire gantry cranes to like, like ships even to these large, large vehicles thinking about, hey, we're doing huge investments already. When I change out these vehicles, should I consider hydrogen or should I consider electricity? Like it's when that change out happens, when that huge investment is already happening, like that's the chance <coughs> for hydrogen to step in. Um, the question is, uh, are the right players gonna be all in the right places at that time when these large fleet companies decide to uh, go hydrogen or go electric, basically? Great. Um yeah, and I think to add on to that, I mean, I'm curious, Sarah, I mean, when we think about the electric vehicle market, are you, are you seeing interest from your customers to create like a fuel cell hydrogen hybrid product? So we hear a lot of feature requests. Uh, customers usually don't get to that level. Um, right. They leave it up to the um, R&D team, basically, to decide like what's the best technology. Um, we don't get right now this feedback, at least not yet. Maybe we will get it in the next coming months or years. Got it. Yeah, and one last thing. It's not actually always even about the customer. It's about the state and their regulations. So if you have folks like uh, the state, so California Air Resources Board and whatnot, deciding that electricity and electrification is the way to go, and you, know, you see them leaning all their funding that way, that's where the market is going to go. It, 
to some, at some point, it's not even the customer. It's, it's where all the state regulations have decided, because that's where all the funding will come from. Yeah. I think we have about five more, que- five more minutes for questions. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, go, go ahead. Hi, I'm Alex Pashalnikov. I'm a principal with consulting firm Arthur D. Little. Also, former Edison employee that thinks utilities are sexy. Um, <laughs> this is a question to you, Sarah. So, as a commercial vehicle OEM, your core business is to make cars. How do you look at charging? Is that just a sales enabler to differentiate you? Or is there a future profit pool there that you'd like to take advantage of? I think it's both. Uh, we do have, as I said, an energy uh, solutions team. Uh, so, we do want to kind of gain some of that business in that area and kind of add to our profit with our, our energy services um, uh, solutions, charging, and products that we are developing towards that. At the same time, right now, um, it is basically, it became uh, to fruition due to the need of expediting infrastructure and uh, trying to shorten as much the lead times and have this great and seamless communication and planning between infrastructure and vehicle delivery and development. So I think it's both, but the reason why we started it was mainly to um, yeah, be able to deliver vehicles and, and um, uh, expedite the, the scale that we can grow. Great. I think we probably have time for two more que- what, one, one or two more questions. We'll see. All right. Making Felipe work. This steps in. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much for uh, uh, that extremely interesting panel. Uh, I have uh, one question. Maybe one elephant in the room was uh, hydrogen. The other is um, um, mining resources. So, uh, as a former banker, uh, I know that you know uh, there's a certain number of uh, um, deposits out there uh, for lithium, et cetera, and they have a cost of extraction which goes up as uh, you uh, basically process uh, uh, this and and, and deplete them. Um, Do you have in your strategic plans any any view or scenario uh, planning or running uh, on the cost of manufacturing the battery, of replacing the battery, what it means for the size of the, of the addressable market. And um, that, that's very much uh, uh, the question here. The question is for me? Yeah, so I if, understand. Oh, in general? Yeah, so, so the question is more on, you know, I guess you're asking, like, what, what's the plan for reducing the cost of manufacturing a battery? What's the plan, what's the plan to assess uh, the potential volatility around the Got cost it. of managing the battery because Got it. there's a certain quantity of lithium uh, that we can uh, mine from the world. Got it. Yeah, I think that would be a question for Sarah. You... That's a tough one. Um, yeah, I think that... We, I think... We, okay, so we are definitely seeing increase in raw materials, so that's, that's a thing that's happening. The cell cost has decreased, though, uh, in the last year or last few months. That's happening as well. Um, in terms of volatility, do you mean more like on the long run? How, for how longer can we continue building batteries due to this um, kind of limited uh, material? Okay, so um, Honestly, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know uh, for how many years or how many more products can we build. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, that would be a very good um, project to do. If anyone here is interested on <laughs> kicking that off, let me know. I'm happy to support. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think it's like any other type of um, uh, raw material that we are using for many other products. Like, they are all, none of them is infinite except for renewable energy and um yeah yeah i I honestly hard hard to answer that yeah i think think i'll add i'm actually interning uh here at a startup at ucla that's working on a new method to extract lithium i think you are seeing new methods to to get lithium out of the ground whether 
you know, through different sorbents or through membranes where you can, you know, start to extract lithium from the United States. So I think that's the other big part of getting these resources domestically when a lot of that supply chain is in, is in China. So I think, um, yeah, you are seeing new innovation. And so it's, you know, turn, turning the corners, hopefully. Um, I think that concludes our time here. So I'll hand it back to Alex. But yeah, thank you so much for, for being here.